Welcome back. This is episode six in a series on how to go from dreaming about sailing to full-time cruising. Today, I will cover step one in the boat buying process. What actually happens when you decide to go start looking at a boat with the possibility of living full-time and enjoying the amazing world that sailing has to offer. Buying a boat is similar to a real estate transaction. It can be a bit complex and involves a lot of risk if going at it alone. This is where a yacht broker can help. As the buyer of a vessel, the yacht broker costs you personally nothing, kind of. However, as a seller of the vessel, there is a fee to be paid to the selling broker, so that in turn will drive the price of the boat up, and although you don't pay personally out of pocket to the brokers, you do wind up paying more for the vessel than if you found one for sale by owner. A good yacht broker will work hard to facilitate the entire transaction as well as protect the interest of their clients, just as a real estate agent will do when you sell or buy a home. One of the key things a broker can do for you, the buyer, is ensure that the seller lives up to the contract. Good brokers use a standard contract that provides, among other things, for an escrow account to hold your deposit. Under that contract, you should be afforded sufficient time to locate a surveyor to inspect the boat and arrange financing if needed. During that time, your deposit is held by the broker in the escrow account and not mingled with his or her other funds. Brokers, to the best of their ability, have a duty to protect the public against fraud, misrepresentation, and unethical practices. That's part of the Certified Professional Yacht Broker Code of Ethics. The study guide for the certification exam suggests that this duty includes full disclosure about the vessel. A judge ruled in 2005 that Marine Max of Ohio had to pay a boat owner $1.9 million for failing to tell him the 51-foot Sea Ray he bought from the dealership had been badly damaged in a grounding, then inadequately repaired. The judge characterized the fraud as, quote, the withholding of material information as particularly gross and egregious. Now, anytime you use a broker, you have to make sure the sales contract does reference surveys, financing, sea trials, and inventory exclusions. That way, if the surveyors should find grounds for backing out of a deal, or if you cannot find financing in time, your deposit will be returned. It is the broker's job to see that that happens and also, be sure to put a big enough deposit in escrow when you sign the purchase agreement so you can tap it and reduce the purchase price to correct any problems found in the survey or sea trap. At the same time, it is the broker's job to determine whether the boat is free of liens, another potential deal breaker. There are two dates the broker should make the buyer aware of, the acceptance date and the closing date. The acceptance date is the day specified in the contract by which the survey and financing must be completed and the buyer has to accept the contract. The closing date is the day the money is paid and the deal is 100% completed. Some countries and US states like California and Florida require licensing of their yacht brokers. Most brokers in the US and Canada prefer to sign a central agency listing with the owner slash seller, which is similar to a multiple listing in real estate transactions. Essentially, this means your broker will manage all the communications and information flow about the listing between you, other brokers, and potential sellers. There are several ways to find brokers who value your trust. As any seasoned skipper knows, you can seek out local knowledge, prowl the docks, and ask other boaters whom they have used. Look for boaters who have used a broker more than one time and still have good things to say about him or her. That's a pretty good recommendation. Talk to marine repair shops, boatyards, or other locals in the industry. The best thing to do is go to one of the broker's professional organizations. The Yacht Brokers Association of America sets standards of ethics and business practices for its members and provides a list of member brokers, as do the Florida Yacht Brokers Association, the California Yacht Brokers Association, and so on. All of these groups contributed to the creation of a certification program that educates brokers in the field and tests their knowledge while holding them to a code of ethics. Violation of the code can result in termination of their professional membership and loss of their certification. 
I do want to take just a quick break and mention that I have created a complete online sailing community for you, my viewers. This is not a Facebook group or a Patreon messaging back and forth community. This is a live, in real time, entire community of people who are just like you. They all have several questions and are in various stages of either becoming full-time cruisers or are already doing so. In the community, I can chat with you live in real time as well as virtual boat shop with you and help answer any questions you may have about sailing in general or specific boats. I am on the community every day and available to help in any way I can. It is only $10 a month through Patreon, so roughly 30 cents a day. It's not $10 per episode. This way, we can become friends, family, and make lasting memories together while sharing all of our experiences in the world of sailing as well as helping as many new hopeful sailors as possible. It's cheaper than your Netflix account and gets you closer to your sailing dreams and goals while being a part of a very active community of like-minded people with the same goals and aspirations. Now, back to Boat Brokers. The Ethics Code sets high standards in all areas. There are more than 500 brokers across North America that are certified. But, for example, there are over 10,000 practicing brokers in Florida alone and tens of thousands or more in the United States. So that makes it pretty clear that finding a broker with your best interest at heart is going to be a broker that's a part of the Yacht Brokers Association of America or something similar. Now, some independent minded brokers may be very good brokers but aren't joiners. They don't like associations. Typically, the guys that commit violations aren't members of any organization. If you are considering a non-affiliated broker, just do your homework, make sure you vet candidates, and seek out local knowledge. Once you do think you have found a qualified broker, get to know him or her. Walk the docks with them, look around their office. Are they a busy broker? That's generally a good sign. However, in this market, it's kind of weird right now, so don't use that as your sole deciding factor. Is the broker working solely by cell phone because they can't afford an office? That's generally a bad sign. Does a person have time to actually listen to you, get to know you, find out your needs? When the same broker lists the boat and finds a buyer for it, that broker gets the whole commission. But most boats are placed in a multiple listing service, the same as real estate. If another broker finds a buyer, the commission is split. It's often 50-50, but sometimes the selling broker gets 60 and the listing broker gets 40%, especially among bigger brokerage houses. So. When you are alone without a broker, call a listing broker to look at a boat. Keep in mind, he sees dollar signs and knows if he can sell you the boat, he gets 100% of the commission. That's a big incentive to tell you how great the boat is, and they might not have your best interest at heart. The frequency of split commissions has declined since the internet made it much, much easier for boats to be shopped for online. Now, a buyer is more likely to go directly to the listing broker. So new boat dealers also have brokerage departments that sell used boats. The customer should distinguish between a brokerage boat the dealer represents and one the dealership owns. If you do find a boat that a dealership does own, just keep in mind they usually are more inclined to negotiate on price. Don't be afraid to lowball a dealer owned boat. The worst they can do is tell you no. Whether you are dealing with a broker who listed a boat or have engaged a broker to help you search, you can expect first to be questions about your wants and needs. Even if you think you know precisely what boat you want, the broker will do you a service by showing you a range of similar vessels. There may be boats you are unaware of that would come closer to your ideal than you thought. In a perfect world, the broker also will make sure the boats he or she presents to you are within your means, both financially and in terms of your ability to safely operate them. Don't expect a broker to warranty the boat or recommend a specific surveyor, finance company, or insurer. Brokers quite often will have a list of surveyors and brochures supplied by insurers and lenders. But if a broker strongly urges you to use a particular surveyor or other service, it may be time to reconsider your involvement with that broker. Should you ever buy a boat without a broker? Yes and no. If you know the boat owner, know the boat, and know the boat's market value, you may well be happier dealing directly with the seller. Also, most brokers charge a minimum commission. If the fee is $1,500 and the boat is worth $5,000, you'd probably be better off with a private sale. But beware, you may not really know the market as well as you think. 
There could be liens on the boat of which you are unaware, and they follow the boat. Even though you bought it, they now become your liens. And if you place a deposit before a survey, you will have no guarantee the money will find its way back into your bank account. Now in the next episode, we'll cover surveys, sea trials, haul-outs, pre-surveys, and ways to save money on those. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you on the next episode.